Well, good morning, dear ones, and welcome to the new reality of Westside Church during our, uh, our social distancing and, and uh, sheltering in place during the COVID-19 crisis. I do pray that you're all safe and uh, that you are well, and we want you to know that we still love you and we are praying for you. And uh, this is uh, something that I'm actually very appreciative for, which is the ability to connect with you digitally and to be able to bring to you uh, our worship service now um, via the internet. And uh, to me, that is a great blessing. And, and I truly want to give thanks to uh, Art Zaragoza Jr., our, uh, our expert in these areas who has done such a fine job of keeping you up to date as to what's happening as these events are very fluid and changing all the time. Uh, I appreciate the fact that he can do stuff that I could only dream of doing when it comes to getting this information to you. And to that end, if you're watching this video now, uh, we want you to know a few things. First of all, uh, there are links available uh, beneath the video that will enable you to do some of the more important things um, during this time that we, we hope you will do. Uh, the first is to submit to us any prayer requests that you might have or any special needs as well. If, if you're out there and, and you need some help, uh, whether it's trying to get to the grocery store or to the doctor or something, um, please let us know. Um, we wanna try to make sure that we still minister to our congregation and help them as much as possible. And if we can't get you the help you need, then uh, we, will, we will put somebody on the job, get you connected with somebody who can. So if you have a need, please let us know. We want to still try to minister in the name of Christ, even during this difficult time. And if you have a prayer request especially, let us know. Uh, our men, our elders are still going to be praying uh, every Tuesday morning as they have been. And so if you give us those needs, we promise we will be praying for them. And we'll make sure that people in the body who, who love to pray will be lifting you up as well. Uh, the other thing that's available with this link is, is uh, a link for online giving. And uh, those of you who attend Westside regularly uh, know that money, talking about money, isn't my favorite thing in the world. But there are needs that continue on, even though we're, we're not able to assemble together. Uh, we still have financial obligations, just as you do. And we know this is a scary time. We know that a lot of you are wondering whether you're going to have a job, uh, you know, when this is done, or even now. I know you're wondering how you're going to get your bills paid. And so we can appreciate that and we are praying for you. We are all in this together. But we do pray that uh, if you are able, that you would continue to support this ministry and you can do so either with our online link, which is uh, below, or we also have our mailing address where if you're old school and you would just like to uh, send your, your tithe, your offering in that way, uh, the address is listed below and you can, uh, you can do that. We would certainly appreciate all of your gifts. And I also want to thank every one of you that have been giving faithfully and will continue to give faithfully because without you, we simply couldn't do this. And so I am so appreciative to God for all of the vehicles that he has provided for us to stay connected with you and for you to stay connected with us. And we promise that we will continue to be in contact with you and keep you updated. Uh, be sure to watch social media if you are uh, on social media. Keep an eye on that so that you can have any updates that are available. And Artie's going to be sending out a regular email. Uh, the one that will go out tomorrow morning, Sunday, 10 a.m., will go out every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. And it will include uh, a video of our worship service and also uh, the links for online giving, the uh, web, uh, the email address for sending in prayer requests and needs and that nature. And, and uh, so we just pray, keep an eye on all this stuff. We know it's happening fast, but we are thankful that we have the opportunity to be able to connect with you still. And we pray that you will stay connected with us. And so uh, we look forward to see what God is gonna do in these days ahead. And to that end, I have a very special message for you this morning to help you deal with the situation that you're in now. And my prayer is, and my belief is, is that it's gonna be very, very encouraging to you.
situation in the Old Testament that I think is very comparable to what you and I are dealing with now. But before we do that, let's start with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you this morning that we can come to your word. I pray for all of your dear ones as they're watching this, wherever they are, whatever they're going through. Lord, I pray that it would be an encouragement to them and an instruction to them, and that, Father, it would stir passion within them first for you and for your kingdom, and then for the world around them, to be a difference maker. Lord, we have to be safe. We need to ensure that we don't spread this virus any faster. And I do pray, Lord, that you would help it to be flattened out and that we wouldn't have a crisis at our hospitals or with our doctors, that there would be plenty of supplies and, and that everything would flow smoothly and that you would see us through this as I know you will. But Lord, I pray this morning you would speak and speak clearly through your word, that we might be heartened and reminded of all of the wondrous work that you are doing, even now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Alrighty, well, I invite you to take your Bibles and turn to Jeremiah chapter 29. And we are going to take a look at our message. It's titled, Daybreak, Finding Peace in Difficult Times. And we're going to be talking about a period in Israel's history where they were really struggling. They were going through some difficult, difficult times, and God did an amazing thing, even in the midst of their difficulty, and he showed them how they could have peace during that time. So that's what we're going to be taking a look at. In Jeremiah 29, what you have essentially is a letter that is ostensibly written by Jeremiah, but really is God's Word. It's his, it's his message to his people as they are being dragged off into captivity. For the first time in Judah's history, they have been defeated militarily. They've been crushed. Now, they've been attacked before, but this is the first time that really the entire city was waylaid and brought down by uh, the Babylonians, led by their general who would become their king, a guy by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. And in 597, after a long siege, 597 BC, he defeated the city of Jerusalem and brought them to their knees and then swept in with his military and took away all of their more important people from their royal court to all of their trained artisans. Anybody that was good at anything, anybody that was a natural leader, they got rounded up and taken off back to Babylon. And when uh, Nebuchadnezzar did that, it left the city crippled. There was a dearth of leadership. They didn't know what was going to happen. Uh, they were still stunned by the fact that they had been uh, brought down by this nation because they didn't understand why God hadn't protected them. They didn't understand why they had fallen, why such difficult times had come. And they would soon discover that because Jeremiah was God's spokesman, and he kept telling the people what it was all about. And in this letter that is contained in chapter 29, God really spells out not only why they were in the situation they were, 
what the situation meant, what they could learn from it, and what he was going to do at the end. So you kind of have the beginning and the end, the whole picture of God spelling out what's going on in, in, in Judah and now in Babylon through this letter. And what Jeremiah basically says is that the reason you were defeated is because you didn't listen to God. You didn't listen to him. When God had warned you time and time again, dating all the way back to the time of Moses, that if you'll keep my covenant, if you'll serve me and worship me, then I will protect you. I will take care of you. I will love you. I'll be your God. You'll be my people and everything will be good. You won't have to worry about your enemies that surround you. You'll be fine. But if you don't, if you go the way of the peoples that surrounded you, if you go the way of the people that I removed to put you in place in Israel, then you will in fact be disciplined. And even though Jeremiah had warned them time and time and time again that you guys are worshiping false gods, you're, you're caught up in wickedness, God is not pleased, you need to turn while there's still time, they wouldn't listen, they kept going their own way, they were arrogant. And so eventually God brought discipline to them. And the discipline came in the form of the Babylonian Empire. When they swept through and took their people off into captivity, that was the beginning of their discipline. And of the group that was taken into Babylon, one of them was a young man by the name of Daniel, who would be instrumental later on in helping to pave the way for these people to return to their homeland, along with people like Ezra and Nehemiah. But for now, they're being taken off into captivity, and in this letter, Jeremiah warns them against something that was going on. What was going on was that they were being told by certain false prophets who had, who had been around for a long time and who had been making the people feel good about their own sin, and many of them were leading the people off into idolatry. They were being told by these false prophets that, hey, don't worry about it. You know, our deity is strong, and he's going to take us up out of Babylon and back home in no time. This isn't going to last very long at all. Don't worry. Everything's going to be good. And when Jeremiah rose up and said, no, it isn't. No, it isn't. This is, you're not going anywhere. God has ordained that you're going to be in Babylon for 70 years. Jeremiah tells him, listen, you might as well start building homes and settling down and allowing your kids to get married and moving on with life because you're not going anywhere for 70 years. This is your new home. He also tells them, listen, you need to pray for this new city that you're in, Babylon. You need to pray for its peace and for its prosperity because the fate of this city will be your fate. You are now citizens of Babylon as discipline for what you've been doing. And when the false prophets heard about that, they got mad at Jeremiah and tried to bring, bring trouble to him. And then God disciplines them heavily for that. And the people eventually, as time goes on, figure out, hey, we really are stuck here. God really is going to let this happen. And they were strangers and aliens in a place where most of the people around them didn't speak the same language. Where uh, their religion was very different than what the Jews from Jerusalem practiced. And so they had a lot of getting used to. They were, they were in a place where they didn't belong. It wasn't really their home. And, and they were going to have to make the best of that situation. Which, frankly, is kind of reminiscent of the situation that uh, we are in as a church in this time. That we are strangers and aliens in this country. Even though we are Americans and, you know, this is the place we love, the land of the free and all of that. Uh, ultimately, it is in our home. Our home is in heaven. And so we are called to pray for this place, to seek peace and prosperity here. But, and, and yes, we have to build our homes and let our kids get married and, and carry on with life. But ultimately, we are called into the service of our God. But the good news was that Jeremiah told them, listen, when the time is up, and after God has taught you through this time what he wants you to learn, he is going to lift you up out of here, and he is going to take you home. But for now, stay in place and do what God has called you to do. And during this time, you're going to learn some important lessons. Three, as a matter of fact, that our passage today talks about. So let's 
find out what those three lessons were and how they apply to where you and I are right now in this situation. I'm reading from Jeremiah chapter 29, starting at verse 11, a familiar verse to many of you who, who know the scripture. This is the Lord speaking to his people, and he says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Let's break that down. First of all, God begins by saying, For I know. I know. Now, you know, that is a statement that only God can make. The false prophets were running around making all kinds of false claims. Oh, we know God's going to get us out of here. We know the situation is going to last. There's nothing to worry about. But they didn't know that. And as a matter of fact, they were dead wrong about it. Only God really knows that kind of information. Only God knows the beginning from the end. Only God knows the future and the past and the present. He knows you and I intimately. God alone has that kind of knowledge, which is good news for us because when he makes a pronouncement, when he makes a statement, you can rest easy in the fact that he's not just talking off the top of his head. He is sharing from his knowledge. You know, it says in 1 Samuel 2, 3, it says, don't keep talking so proudly or let your mouth speak such arrogance. For the Lord is a God who knows and by him deeds are weighed. See, God knows everything and he evaluates everything based on that knowledge, based on that wisdom. Isaiah 46 Verses 9 and 10, it says, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. Our God is unique and he knows. That's the first bit of good news. And these people that are stuck in Babylon, I'm sure that was uh, something of a reassurance for them. That finally somebody who knows what they're talking about. And then he says... I know what? The plans I have for you. God reassures his people by letting them know that despite the fact that your world is being rocked right now, despite the fact that you're shocked and surprised as to what has happened and how fast it has happened and, and what it means for you, and it's it's just you know changed everything, God has plans for you. I know the plans I have for you. Now, that's good news. God has a plan for us. That's good news. Here's the bad news. God's plans for us are rarely the same as our plans for us. And the reason for that is, is because we are vexed by sin. We are corrupted by it. It, it infects everything, including the way we think and, and the values which we have, which then determine, you know, the things that we make plans for. God's plans for us are rarely the same as our plans for us, which means when God's plan goes into place, our plans are going to be disrupted. And you just have to allow for that. You have to allow for the fact that sometimes God's plan is going to disrupt your plan. But here is some good news. God's plan for you is much better than your plan for you. God's plan for you is always what's best. Why? Because he knows. You don't know. I don't know. We make our plans, but... Our plans could be horrible. There's been times when I've made plans to do things and I thought it was a, a great plan. It turned out to be a disaster. I mean, not long ago, my wife and I, we made plans to, to get away for our anniversary. We had it all planned out and mapped out and we went up to this little resort where we wanted to stay and we got there, we got checked in, we got in the room and found out there's no power. 
And they told us, well, don't worry. They plan to have the power on by, you know, three this afternoon. So we thought, okay, well, three this afternoon, that's not bad. Three came and went, still no power. So I went down and I asked, hey, when's the power gonna come on? They said, oh, don't worry. They plan for the power to come on at 6 p.m. But 6 p.m. came and went, no power. We spent the night with no power and it was freezing. And I was sitting there in the middle of the night thinking to myself, boy, this wasn't a very good plan. We make our plans, but we don't know. And sometimes God will interrupt your plans, but when he does, you have to understand that his plan is always better than your plan. And that's really good news. Proverbs 19, 21 says, many are the plans in a person's heart. We're always making plans. We got all kinds of plans. I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that, today or tomorrow. It says, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. And don't fight that. That is a good thing, even when it doesn't make sense, even when it hurts, even when it means you gotta stay locked up in your house and can't go anywhere and can't go to work and you're frustrated, even if you're sick with some strange virus. God's purpose prevails. And you gotta trust in it, and you gotta lean into it, and then you will realize the blessing. And what is God trying to teach us through all of this? Three things. He knows, he has plans. What are his plans? Number one, plans to give us a hope and a future, it says in verse 11. A hope and a future. Now. If you go into the original text of Hebrew, and I, and I won't bore you with the details of that, um, the grammar indicates that those two words are actually interconnected. The way it actually reads in the original language is a hopeful future. God has plans. He knows he's going to give us a hopeful future. So while things look really bleak for them, they're being carted off to this strange city. They're going to encounter hardship. They're going to be treated as outsiders. They're, going to, they're even going to suffer some racism and some difficulty and some persecution. But God has plans, and the plans are for them to have a hopeful future. They didn't need to despair over the difficulties that they were going to face because God had a hopeful future for them, a hopeful future. Because they had Jehovah as their God, they didn't need to be afraid of today or even tomorrow. God was giving them hope. It says in Hebrews 6, 19, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It's the idea of a ship that's in the middle of a storm, and well, all they can do is they drop anchor, and they sit tight, and they wait out the storm knowing that the anchor is going to keep them there. They don't, they're not going to get swept off into the reef and destroyed. That's what our hopeful future is. We can drop anchor and know we're fine. That's kind of what you're doing right now as you're watching this. You have had your anchor dropped for you, but it is dropped and just trust that God has a hopeful future for you. There may be difficult times now, but things are going to be all right because we have God. He is our anchor. He's our refuge. And we can trust in him. That's the first thing that he wants us to realize. We have a hopeful future because we have him. We'll talk about that more in a few minutes. The second thing that God is trying to teach them through this difficult time is that we need to call on him and come and pray. To call on him and come pray. And pray, especially at a difficult time. He says, then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I'll listen to you. One of the things that the Jews were going to learn as they were stuck in Babylon was how to pray again. Which indicates they had sort of forgotten about that. When he uses that word, then, it indicates that they hadn't been doing much of that. And if you read the history of Israel leading up to the captivity, they hadn't. Now, it didn't mean they were never praying. They were praying to all kinds of things, but they weren't praying to their God. 
And he wants them to come home and start praying to him. That's what he's trying to teach them. The first thing he's trying to teach them is that they had a hopeful future. So, so don't just get so discouraged that you give up and climb under the bed. You have a future because you have God. Second thing is, I want you to call on me in the midst of this difficult time. I want you to learn how to pray. And I want you to be reassured in the fact that when you do, I'm going to listen and I'm going to do things that are going to amaze you. And what's ironic is that if you take a look at the history of what happened to the Jews while they were stuck in Babylon, is that's exactly what happened. I mean, right off the get-go, if you read the book of Daniel, you see that Daniel and his friends were, were, were put into a severe test. As to whether or not they would eat the king's food or, or keep the kosher laws that made them uh, unique as, as, as uh, you know, children of Abraham. And they do that, but they pray. Then another calamity comes along where the king has some weird dream that he's really disturbed over. And he wants to know what it all means. And, and when his, his you know, false prophets and soothsayers say to him, well, tell us the dream and we'll give you the interpretation. And the king says, no, 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 no. You tell me what I dreamed, then I'll know that your interpretation is correct. Well, who can do something like that? They knew they couldn't. They were exposed as phonies. Daniel prays. He fasts. And when he does, God listens and gives him the dream because the original dream was from God. That's what happens when we learn to pray. God listens and he answers. He rocks us with his answers. He does amazing things when his people humble themselves and pray. That's what God wants to teach the Jews during this difficult time. Beloved, that's what he wants to teach you and me during our difficult time. We need to learn how to pray again. Now, I know many of you do pray, and I'm thankful for it, but not enough of us are praying. And our country, for certain, isn't praying but I'll make a little prediction for you. I'll bet you that there are more people in our country and in this state and in this city that are praying now than were praying a month ago. You know why? Because they're scared. And that's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing to be scared. And it's not a bad thing to pray because you're scared. God uses these difficult times to teach us these things because these things are good for us. It's like, it's like a parent making their child eat their vegetables. The, the, the child doesn't want to eat the broccoli, but they need to. We need to learn how to pray because we need to know that God listens and answers. It says in Jeremiah 32, 17, the same prophet, he, he says this about the Lord. He says, Ah, sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Man, is that good news. God doesn't just listen. He responds when we pray. He says, Then you will call out to me. You'll call out to me. Beloved, don't be afraid. Call out to your God right now, right where you are. Call out to your God. He's waiting to listen. It's been a while for some of you. Call out to him and let him show you what he's capable of. He wants his people to stop turning to and relying on the worthless resources of this world, the things that most people look to when trouble comes. Do I have enough money? Do I have power? Well, maybe if I'm famous, that'll protect me. Maybe if I'm smart enough, or maybe if I have enough physical strength. We always look to our own resources, or we look to the resources that the world looks to, and we don't call out to our God, and then we wonder why things are such a disaster, because we are neglecting the most important resource we have. Matter of fact, the only resource we have. All that other stuff will fail you. He's the only one who won't. Turn to him. Call to him. You know, who, who do you call to when trouble comes? What do you look to when life gets scary or confusing? 
And then the third thing that God wants his people to learn during this difficult time is to seek him. He wants them to know they have a hopeful future. He wants to, them to call on him so that he can show that he's listening and that he has power to do stuff about it. And then lastly, he wants his people to seek him. To abandon all of the dead, empty pursuits that they had been giving their allegiance to before. All of the idolatry and the wickedness. And he wanted them to turn their hearts back toward him. To turn their hearts back toward him. And beloved, that's what adversity does. It turns our hearts back to God. You know, the Bible compares us as believers to children many times. And, and children are very predictable. Kids have been acting the same way for, for years and years and years. And one of the things kids tend to do is when they get out on their own is, is to get a little big for their britches. That's what my, my grandma used to call it. Get a little big for their britches. They, they think they're just bigger and stronger and safer than they are until something scares them. And then you know what they do? They go running home to mama. They go running home to dad. And typically get behind them. You know, that's what adversity does. It's in our nature. Adversity drives us back to God. I was reminded the other day about 9-11. I still remember where I was uh, when 9-11 happened. I remember my wife, you know, taking me over to the TV and showing me as, as in real time aircraft were, were being flown directly into the World Trade Center. When the Pentagon was burning, when aircraft were in the air, and people were wondering what was going to be destroyed next. And, and I remember the national mood was fear. We had been shaken. And frankly, America had gotten a little big for its bridges. And, and God used that time to not just humble us, but to bring us back to him. And I, and I remember, you know, on, on, the, on the steps of Congress, of senators and congressmen who can't stand each other were joining arm in arm and singing God Bless America. We were hanging up tattered flags from the World Trade Center as, as a sign of our unity. And people were praying. People were going to church. I, I mean, I had people uh, at the time, I was, I was shepherding uh, up in Chachilla, and I had people you know, coming to me and saying, are you going to have a service? I don't really go to church, but I'm just looking for a place to congregate. People were calling with prayer requests, and people were calling, and they were crying because they were afraid. You know, when difficult times come, we seek the face of our God. We turn our hearts back toward Him. That is a good thing. It's what He wants us to learn. That we have a hopeful future because of Him. That we can seek Him and He will listen. And that we can turn our hearts back to Him. Turn our hearts back. He wants our hearts. He doesn't want us to... You know, be religious for the sake of being religious. He didn't care about empty religion. He wants our hearts. He wants it to be genuine. It's the difference between, you know, buying somebody a gift because you have to and, and getting them something because you love them and you're thinking about it. Isaiah 45, 22 says, Turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. All right, let's tie this all together. How do we find peace in difficult times? Three ways. Number one, we find peace in hope. In hope. You know, if you don't have hope, you'll never have peace. And if you're looking for hope in the wrong place, you're never going to find it. The world cannot provide you with hope. It can provide a lot of things, but it can't provide that. Only God can give us hope, because He is hope. It says in Romans 15, 13, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. In order to have hope and peace which are just two sides of the same coin, you have to trust in God because He's the only one that can give it to you. And what is ironic is we fight that tooth and nail 
We want to put our hope in money. We want to put our hope in our strength. We want to put our hope in all the resources we can gather, just like the Jews had done. And it had failed them. Matter of fact, it had taken them away from the only hope that they had. Matter of fact, hope is embodied. In Titus 2.13, it says, We wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is our hope. The work He did on the cross is our hope. Let me ask you, do you have hope? Or are you in despair? If you're in despair, let me encourage you that there is a hope. And that hope is embodied in Jesus Christ. And he's calling to you. He's asking you now during this difficult time. Put a little faith in him. Just even a little mustard seeds worth. Put a little faith in him. Realize that there is hope and you can step right into it. That's good news. It's encouraging. You have hope. You don't need to despair. If you have Jesus, you have everything you need. Conversely, if you don't have Christ, you have nothing you need. And you will despair. Because life will take you there. Sooner or later, life will buckle your knees for you. Take it from an old guy who had his, had his knees buckled more than a few times. Your hope is in Christ. The second thing we find peace in, the first thing is hope, the second thing is in hearing. In other words, in the fact that God hears us, that we have somebody we can go talk to when we're in the midst of this kind of a mess. And he doesn't get tired of hearing from us, and he isn't annoyed when we come talk to him, even if it's been a long time. He doesn't sit back with his arms crossed and say, oh really? Really? Now you're going to come talk to me? Because it's you know, now that you're scared by COVID-19? Well, I don't think so. You don't want to come talk to me in good times? Get out of here. He doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. He's glad when we want to come talk to him. Just like a parent. Listen, when you're a parent, if you've had a kid and that kid maybe has gone astray and doesn't want to see you and doesn't want to talk to you, when that, parent, when that child finally calls you, your heart rejoices. You want to see them. Jesus illustrated that when he told the story of the prodigal son. You know, the hero of the story of the prodigal son is the prodigal father, who had said, kept watch. He kept, every day he would get up and go, keep watch over the trail that led home, waiting, hoping against hope that one day his boy was going to come home. And when he did, it says that he went running out to meet him. That's the heart of your God. That's Jesus describing the Heavenly Father. He wants you to know that He is listening. He wants to hear your voice. He's waiting for you to call out. Call out! It says, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and His ears are attentive to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Listen, if you continue to reject God and turn away, then He's, okay, He'll let you go do that. But if you call out to him, it says that he's leaning in and he's listening. So we find peace in hope. We find peace in hearing, in God's hearing. And lastly, we find peace in heart. In heart. In other words, when we turn our heart toward God, he gives us peace. Because we're finally looking in the right direction. Instead of looking around and panicking, we're looking up. And we're seeing where our help comes from. I love the fact in the scripture that it says that he's the lifter of our head. Like a, like a parent with a child that's starting to panic and freak out and just leans down very gently and kind of right underneath the chin, lifts up the head and says, look at me, sweetheart. You're going to be all right. You're with me. That's what God wants us to do, to turn our heart toward Him. Maybe your heart has been divided. Maybe your heart has been corrupted. Maybe your heart is black and full of all kinds of ugliness. He wants to clean your heart through what Christ did on the cross, and then He wants to own your heart. 
He wants to be the one person that you can count on, that you turn to, that you spend time with, that you're committed to, that you love, because he loves you. Oh, if we only loved God a fraction of how much he loves us, it would be overpowering. David, in speaking to his son Solomon, said this in 1 Chronicles 28, 9, And you, my son Solomon, acknowledge the God of your father and serve him with wholehearted devotion and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches every heart and understands every desire and every thought. If you seek him, he'll be found by you. But if you forsake him, he'll reject you forever. Seek the Lord while there's still time. Seek the Lord. There's no better time than now. You got nothing better to do right now. You got a lot of free time on your hands. The other day I was watching ESPN and for the first time in years I was bored after 10 minutes. Because there's nothing to report. There's nothing going on. Because God is taking us and saying, hey, listen, it's time you looked up. It's time you called out. It's time you realized you have a hope and a future here. Turn to me. Come back to me. And I'll do some amazing stuff in your life. I think we'd be amazed if we did these three things, beloved. I think God would change everything. I'll close with one last story. This is... Uh, from the news, uh, there's a physician, his name is Daniel McNeely. He's a pediatric neurosurgeon in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And because of what he does for a living, he's used to dealing with frightened parents and frightened children who are facing procedures that are, that are scary, frankly. And uh, so he, he, he gets used to having to do a lot of reassuring. But on September the 30th of 2018, a, a very unique situation occurred. Um, he was headed into surgery, and he greeted this little eight-year-old boy, uh, a patient of his, who was being brought in for a very specific procedure. And while he was being wheeled into surgery, the little boy was, was clutching his favorite stuffed animal. And before they put him under, he looked up at the doctor and he said this. He said, my bear is ripped. Can you please fix him up too? The boy was identified as Jackson McKee and he has a cyst on his brain and also a chronic condition that is known as hydrocephalus, which is uh, an accumulation of cerebrospinal fluid within the brain that if it's untreated can and will do great damage. And to that end, the surgery that, that little Jackson was about to have was to drain off some of the fluid that was building tremendous pressure in his skull. Well, the doctor was moved by this little boy's sincere request. So he assured him that he would indeed take care of his little stuffed bear. And to his credit, he actually did. Once McNeely had performed the successful surgery on the boy's brain, he placed the bear on the same table as the little boy had been on. And he put on blue gloves, and he used leftover stitches from the child's surgery to repair the, an underarm tear on the little stuffed bear. And then in another first, McNeely, who had never done much on social media before, took to Twitter for the very first time to post a photo of the moment that had been captured by a resident. And the caption read, patient asks if I can also fix teddy bear just before being put off to sleep. How could I say no? He fixed the little bear and he gave it back to eight-year-old Jackson. Jackson's father was predictably thankful he said this in a later interview. He said, he, speaking of Dr. McNeely, said he's one of the nicest human beings I've ever met. McKee said that his son was thrilled when he woke up to see his stuffed buddy, which he takes with him everywhere he goes, and that he had been stitched up just like him. 
McKee said that his family has deeply appreciated McNeely's skilled medical care over the years, as well as his warm bedside manner. In a final quote, he said, you know, when we get there, in other words, to see uh, Dr. McNeely, he says, when we get there, we're terrified to death, but every time we speak with him, we always feel better. And that doctor is giving us a picture of the kind of relationship God wants us to have with him, where we're trusting, where we realize he's the one that takes care of us and he takes care of the ones we care about. And he sees even the small details. He takes care of them. Beloved, that is a God worth worshiping. It is a God worth praying to. And it is a God who will give us a hopeful future. It doesn't matter what we're going through right now. We're going to be fine because we have Jehovah. Because he has not withheld from us his son. But the main question is, do you know him? Do you have Jesus in your heart? Do you have that hopeful future? Because if you don't, it's an easy fix. You just need to come to him, first of all, recognize Acknowledge that you're a sinner, because we all are. Confess that sin to God, and tell Him you're ready to turn from it. Then take the work of Christ for your own, His death on the cross, His burial, His resurrection. That is payment for our sin. So we have to accept that. We have to take that for our own. And then as we do that, God saves us. He saves us. You just come to him in prayer. You confess your sin. You take the work, the finished work of Jesus Christ on your behalf for yourself. And he saves you. And then he changes you. The Bible says his Holy Spirit comes to live within you. And that spirit transforms you. You don't have to clean up to come to God. You just have to be ready to come and surrender to him. Once you do that, he does the cleaning. He'll change you from the inside out because you'll have his Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit will do what the Holy Spirit always does. Make you holy, little by little, bit by bit. He will transform and change you. And then you will have his righteousness and then you will have that hopeful future. You will have that person that you can call to. You will have a person that you can give your heart to and trust and know that he'll never disappoint or hurt you. You can trust in those things. And then... You need to get committed to a, a Bible teaching church. You need to get yourself a Bible, first off. You need to you know, start praying. You need to let somebody know what has happened so that they can pray for you and encourage you. Yeah, we would love it if you would let us know. If, if you're giving your heart to Christ, you know, you can, you can give us a, a, a shout on the email. Or you can let us know via social media. And we would love to pray for you. If we can help you with some resources, we're willing to do that to get you started on your new walk with him. He will change everything for you. Everything. You just have to give your heart to him. And it's so simple. You just pray that simple prayer. God, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me and save me from my sin. I turn my back on it. And I embrace Christ, the work he did on the cross to save me. That's all I need. That's all I want. Please come into my heart. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and give me that new life and that hopeful future. In Jesus' name, amen. It's really simple. Just please let us know if you did that because we would, we would be so encouraged by that. And uh, we will stand with you in prayer and uh, really, really believe that God is going to do some amazing stuff in your lives. Beloved, we love you. We look forward to the next time we're together. I'm going to close in prayer. Father, just thank you for this time. Thank you for your dear ones, Lord, that are out there. Thank you for each person that prayed that prayer right now. Lord, may you bless them and save them and put them on a new path, Lord. May they get all the things they need resource-wise to begin to grow in their faith. Father, this time together is an encouragement. Help us to, to believe your word, to obey it, to walk in it, and to experience all of its blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, and we'll see you next time.